Hello and welcome to the program. Now, recently, the community of Cape Town has lost an iconic figure in the world of radio broadcasting. Munadia Kiran passed on after a long illness. Obviously, she's left a legacy behind. This iconic figure was known throughout South Africa and beyond. We chat to Shafiq Morton, a close friend and senior colleague, about her life and her time at The Voice of the Cape. Mr. Morton, welcome to the program. I find only a pleasure. Now, recently you know that we've lost a stalwart in media and someone that was obviously connected in, a very, in very much ways to The Voice of the Cape and yourself as a personality, Munadia Kiran. When the name Munadia Kiran comes to mind, what is it that you first think of? When I, when I first uh, um, hear Munadia Kiran's name, the first thing that I think of is a whirlwind of energy. Uh, she was a person, I actually got tired sometimes just watching her work. She was a person who really rolled up her sleeves and got stuck in no matter what uh, the, the problem, no matter what the job was, no matter what the story was. And that was the ethos of Voice of the Cape. She would come in like a, a roaring wind in the morning and sometimes late at night she'd still be behind her desk updating the website, editing stories, uh, sending SMSs to reporters, talking to management people, doing her other job which was in finance. So here was a person who 24-7 was dedicated to what she did and it was always busy, busy and more busy. For someone to inherit that amount of work, I'd say inherit, because uh, I know how these media operations were, obviously Munadi had to be there for a very long time. When did it all start with her? Well, she first came to Voice of the Cape in 1995, and that was the first broadcast of this radio station during Ramadan. It was a special events license. And myself and Munadia were two people that were on the first news team and she was one of the reporters. She did not come on board permanently when the station opened permanently in 1995, but she was basically a freelancer. And she came full-time uh, at Voice of the Cape in 2000. I stepped down as news editor, and she stepped into my shoes, and nothing remained the same ever since. She also took on the role of a program manager along the line as well, and her greatest love, the website which she developed from about the early 2000s. The website was basically a baby, but she did so many other things. She was a presenter as well, a very good presenter. She could do a serious news program. She could go out and do a community program. She was also fully fluent in English and Afrikaans, a fully rounded media personality. Do you believe that a large part of Munaide Karana's personality have infused with that of the voice of the tape? is one of the reasons for the success of the Voice of the Cape as a brand itself. Absolutely. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Manaja Karan was the brand. Um, when, I, when, I, when I remember her, apart from her energy, I will always remember her and Voice of the Cape at exactly the same time. And I mean, her input was beyond that of one person. When, when I think of the things she did, news editor, program director, running shows, phone-ins, that kind of stuff. I mean, she was doing the work of about four or five people. So, with um, going forward and 95 is there, there's various issues and challenges that went along. I recall uh, the licensing matters and the reapplication for licensing. Was she involved in, in all of those things also? Yes, she was also involved in that too. In fact, it's difficult to find something that she wasn't involved in. I think the only thing she didn't do was make the coffee. <laughs> Speaking about the coffee, Munadia on the side, here we've got the job description, you told us all the type of things she was doing at the station, but during the lunch hour, what was happening? How was Munadia? What type of person was she? As viewers and as listeners of the radio station, one doesn't get that aspect of somebody. Uh, you don't know the person behind the person actually. So who was Munadia? That's an interesting question because lunch hour for her was basically eating Nando's at, on the run. But the times that I think I got to know her was after the drive time show, we would end at about six o'clock, then the station would be quiet and there'd be very few people in the building and she'd still be there brainstorming and trying to think of something and then we would sometimes sit down and, and chat about the media, chat about Voice of the Cape and that's where I got to see the other side of Menadia. She is a, a very intelligent person. Um, she is a very sensitive person, although she had to put on a very, very strong face, being a woman in a man's world, as it were. She was also a, an intensely private person. And she even said that although I have a public personality, 
there's a side of me that is private and uh, she actually managed to keep it private. But she was very fond of her family, she, she never married, but often her, her nieces and nephews would come to the station, her family, and her family I think in many uh, instances was her pillar of strength and was also something that I think gave her that human energy basically. How has things changed since her demise? I know that you spoke about this huge bundle of energy and when that is taken away there's obviously a vacuum. How is the voice of the Cape coping with that at the moment? It's not easy because she did so many things and she was also not scared to make decisions. A lot of decisions got made and uh, she had the guts to stand by them. But the good thing about Manaj is she's left a legacy and that is one thing that I think we should be grateful for and we should be proud of. And the one legacy she's left, she's left behind at Voice of the Cape is the website. It's a very curious beast, our website, because it's not a normal radio station website. It has feature stories, it has photographs, it has elements which your normal radio station website doesn't have. I know that our news team, they're struggling to, to, to they can't, in fact it's difficult to get into footsteps, but that's what they're trying to keep up, that legacy, that kind of example. And she also taught a lot of people as well. There are lots of journalists working in mainstream media who were under Manaja's wing. We've got Tasneem Adams, our news editor. She was with Manaja for many years. So I would proudly say that her legacy is quite safe. You spoke about the family. On the family front, have you been getting any news as to how they are coping with her passing? I know that there was some level of preparation in terms of she's been ill for a while. But before going to the family, perhaps tell us about her illness. Um, what part do we know uh, in terms of, we know that she's had cancer, but that road and that journey, and as a friend and as a colleague, how did that affect you guys? Well, it was very difficult, but um, she didn't make it difficult for, for people around her. Uh, her fight against cancer was a very brave one. It was a very long one. Um, in fact, many people say that she should have passed away a long time before she did, but credit to her fighting ability and the fact that she said she has had things to do and she wanted to get them done. But it was something that we had to get used to and it's something that I think all of us learned from. Uh, what it taught us that life is precious. She said she was going to live each day as it came. She was going to enjoy each day. She was going to try and look at the quality of life. Um, and at the same time, she decided to also write about her, her disease. And her blogs on, on her cancer well, I mean, the response to them was, was more than viral, it was absolutely amazing. And so she, she made it easy for all of us to understand what was happening, what was going on. In spite of being an intensely private person, the one thing that she put out in public was the whole process of her cancer. And I think a lot of people learned from it. And I think what we, we take from that is that um, it's something you have to live with, you can still be strong, and you can still have a lot of dignity when you deal with it. I've been following the blog now and then and I picked up that uh, she was pushing out this story about the fact that she wasn't ready, she still had a lot of things to do. Right. The fact that she said that, do you think that somewhere deep down, and it's something that you guys might have picked up on, do you think that deep down she knew that or she prepared somehow to leave? She actually said that um, it's in Allah's hands, everything is. But what is so interesting was that right until the end, the laptop was on her bed, she was doing the website, she was still communicating, and a few days before she passed away, her phone fell silent. For the first time in, in my case, first time I can remember, for something like 18 years, her phone was off. And when her phone went off, I think all of us... It was us, totally off. It was switched off. Okay. You couldn't call her, you couldn't communicate with her. Then we kind of felt this has to be something significant. And three to four days later, she fell into a coma, and um, apparently, just before she passed away, she sort of sat up, said a kalama shahada, and then passed away. So she came out of the coma at that time? That's what, that's what I've been, we've been told, yes. I've heard some people saying that the mother has related that story. Speaking about the mother, on, from your point of view, and you've obviously met the family, how are they doing at this stage? Look, it's very difficult for them. I mean, Manaja was only 47 years of age. She still, she still had so much to offer. I mean, Allah took her away. Allah knows best. It's difficult for them. She was um, the one of three children. She was the youngest of three children. 
her, farm, her father, Molan Yusuf Kiran, very well known in the community, one of the stalwarts she of the community. In that environment. Absolutely. I mean, Menadja, I think one of the, the, the good things for her from the family that she came, she understood community the minute she came into Voice of the Cape. But her family, I think it's been very hard for them. They are a private family, and I think they are dealing with it, you know, together as a family. But I know that in that house, they're going to miss her laughter, and they're going to miss her presence. Going back to 1995, when all of this started, and the Voice of the Cape and its relation with Munadia, do you think that Munadia, after all these years, has pioneered certain areas of Islamic media as a whole in South Africa? Um, I know that there are some level of media convergence that goes on between television, radio and news. But do you think she played an overall picture with regards to Islamic media in South Africa? No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's no, uh, I would say that, you know, the word icon can definitely apply. As a woman, she pioneered women's issues on radio. She went where many angels feared to tread. She took the heat for it as well. She dealt with issues such as homosexuality, the whole marriage scenario, divorce, and a lot of social issues that many people were just too timid to deal with, and she took them face on, head on. I remember this one incident, I, I don't know if you heard about this incident when I came to record here. That was the last time I came to, to film here because Monadi always said that I would rather come out and do an interview with you. And here's the reason why. Being upstairs at some stage, there were some lights that were standing next to Monadi. I was doing a profile on her because she, we had this relation where when I went on to television, she always did interviews with me to try and assist me to get that profile going. And there was this one day where when Munadi was sitting, there was a light on the left-hand side which started catching on fire. And as I looked at her doing the interview, I saw this flame next to it, and I said, I need to stop the interview. And she said, why? And I said, the light next to you is burning. And we ran out of the room. It was somewhere upstairs. And from that day, we always teased each other, and she said that I would rather come do interviews with you outside the office before you burn the voice of the Cape Town. <laughs> and if only she should know I'm here on my second interview, now that she's gone. So, well, nothing is burning. Yeah, yeah, of course. But I mean, that is typical of Manadia. I mean, yeah. focusing so hard on the job, yeah. the building's burning, as you say. <laughs> Why? Why? You know, we've got a job to do. That's her. Yes, correct. That's her. Yeah. With regards to achievements, out there, awards and that sort of thing, how is Manadia fed? She did very well. In fact, she won, I think it's a 2009 um, Vodacom Journalist of the Year Award in the community category. And that was for her work on the issue of Muslim marriages. It was a national award and uh, a very proud moment for her, for her family and of course for Voice of the Cape and I think for Muslim journalists because Muslim journalists were now winning things out there in the mainstream. Well, Mr. Morton, now it's not all about media and the job sometimes, there's a person behind everything and I tried delving into that a bit earlier on, but I want to go a bit deeper into that. Apart from the media aspect and the relationship that you share, tell us a bit about the behind the scenes things, about the, the moments that you remember, the good times, the bad times, the sad times? I mean the good times I think were when at, at Voice of the Cape, being in the media people love eating uh, in this very room, people sitting around and eating and relaxing and uh, the jokes that were going on and also her, she had a sense of humour and her sense of humour was a community sense of humour because I would say she, she, she would make a joke in English and laugh in Afrikaans. And, and that was Manadia basically. She um, enjoyed a, a laugh like anybody else and she had this, uh, this jolly side to her personality which was infectious and um, people would, would immediately relate to it. And that's the side that I remember. I also remember seeing her in some very difficult times when people in the community were really getting down on her for the, the issues that she was trying to, to focus. And the one thing is I never ever saw her cry once, not once. And I sometimes wonder how hard it must have been for her and how difficult it must have been not to show any emotion when the heat was on. But that was her, very, very strong and very determined um, to, you know, to make sure that she would get through all these challenges. But I never saw her cry once. That's very really interesting because somewhere down the line I know that she had to have a passion for what she's done and she's exposed lots of issues in the community to make the lives of others better, being a voice for those that don't have a voice. But at the same time, I suppose one needs to be strong to do those kind of things and hide away your own inhibitions to be able to be a voice for others. Yeah, I think compassion is also about strength. 
Um, if you get emotional about everything, you're not going to get anything done. I mean, another famous person in our community, Dr. Imto Suleiman, says that, you know, when he's in a crisis, he says people might think he's cold, but he says you have to think your way out of it. He said, of course you feel what people are feeling, but if you don't keep your thoughts together, you're not going to survive. 100%. I think you need to be clinical about the way you handle things where the community is involved at the same time. In conclusion, if Munadia was here today, what is it that you tell her? No, I would tell her, well done. Um, carry on and well done. Um, you know, I think you mentioned before the interview, too often we give people verbal wreaths. We, we, you know, we recognize them after they've gone. And I sometimes feel that she was not given the credit for what she did while she was still alive. And I think people should, should realize that. And I hope that her legacy will be remembered and it will be honored. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Only a pleasure. A sad story indeed, the loss of Munadia Kiran, an iconic figure in South African radio broadcasting here at the Voice of the Cape. We just chatted to Shafiq Morton, a close friend and colleague, who gave us all the information on Munadia as a personality and her works in the media. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.